what can we learn from how the best restaurants in the world deal with uncertainty or not knowing? And why are low intervention wines and population wheat important? A fascinating and wide ranging conversation with the author of The Uncertainty Mindset, straight from Marseille. This is the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, where we talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities, and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land and our sea, grow our food, what we eat, wear and consume. And it's time that we as investors, big and small, and consumers start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. To make it easy for fans to support our work, we launched our membership community. And so many of you have joined us as a member. Thank you. If our work created value for you, and if you have the means, and only if you have the means, consider joining us. Find out more on gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. That is gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. Or find the link below. Welcome to another episode and a very special one because we have a guest today who was in the army, worked at Google, studied at some of the world's best restaurants, but is also a woodworker and writes a fascinating newsletter about not knowing and is the author of The Uncertainty Mindset, Innovation Insights from the Frontiers of Food. He's very interested in low intervention wine and population weed and lives between Marseille and the remote French countryside. So welcome, Juan. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be on this quite unusual podcast. Thank you so much. I mean, that was quite an unusual intro. Normally it's, it's yeah, it doesn't touch so many different parts, but I always love to start with a personal question on why the interest in food and then let, let's get to why the interest in food and then the interest in, in interest in agriculture, because often it stops at food. So how did you get interested in food to begin with? And then how did you end up talking about population weed and agriculture and soil and stuff like that? Uh, for sure. So I was born and raised in Singapore. And so if you know any Singaporeans, you'll be aware that all of them are interested in food. So it's kind of a cultural thing for me to be interested in food. But then along the way, um, so I, I went, I worked at Google for a bit in product management, um, as you said, but then after that, I decided to go back to do a PhD um, at a business school. And what I ended up studying there was the organization of innovation in restaurants as a way of understanding how you organize for innovation more generally. And what I studied was restaurants that come up with new ideas in food, which is why I ended up studying uh, the way teams of innovation chefs at some of the world's best restaurants organize themselves to fail frequently, do new things and come up with new ideas. So my interest in food sort of started, as I said, culturally, but then became something which became a, um, it was a, a form of training. And then it became the basis of a dissertation and became the book that you mentioned, The Uncertainty Mindset. Uh, that's why it's called Innovation Insights from the Frontiers of Food. And then the reason why I got interested in agriculture was because one of the things that I learned when I was doing this research on innovation in general was that innovation really comes from a situation where you literally, you have to not know what is going to happen next in order to do something new, right? So you cannot just be in a situation of risk where you don't know exactly what's going to happen, but you know everything about what you don't know. You actually literally have to be in a situation where you don't know what's going to happen so that you can find out. And that's what innovation does. And along the way, as I was trying to understand how teams that do new things organize themselves, I realized that there is a lot of uncertainty and it's not just in food, it's everywhere. There's a lot of non-risk not knowing that's all around us. And it really seemed to affect, uh, especially at these restaurants that I was working at and doing research at, it really seemed to affect the way they worked. Um, it became very clear to me from being at these restaurants that what you see as a guest when you sit down at a restaurant like Noma or the Fat Duck is you see dishes that seem very polished and they come out and they just work. But on the inside, there is a whole team of people that know how to respond to products that look different every day 
products that change over the course of the year. And they can absorb and buffer that uncertainty that happens at the product level, at the time level, and they can filter it all out and produce something. And make delicious. the plates seem exactly. similar or almost the same every yeah. day. Yeah. Or, or even learn how to make new things that are delicious that have never been eaten before out of something which they have never worked on before. That, that also is a problem that you know, the pharmaceutical company has to do. It's what the electronics industry has to do. Any industry that does something new generally works with raw materials that are either known to us but have not been used in this way or brand new raw materials and turns them into products and services that we've never used at all. And because I was- Wasn't that clear from the beginning for you that you wanted to study that in kitchens? Like in this higher end or super innovative, or because you could have done it at an, like an engineering firm Correct. or at Samsung or at, at any company that is at yeah. the cutting edge of something, yeah. they're doing similar things, just not with delicious food. Uh, absolutely. So the, the reason I understand I, why you did it, but I don't <laughs> understand how you got there. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the reason, the, the reason I give people for doing that is that, uh, there's actually a really good formal reason why you study restaurant R and D to understand innovation more generally. Like if I went to a microchip foundry, which is where people often study innovation, right? They look at microchip foundries, car manufacturers, software companies, the innovation cycle time is very long. Like for a, for a microchip might be like a year and a half, two years, three years from the idea through the design process to actually seeing a chip in a, in a box somewhere, right? Whereas with a restaurant, you can see multiple cycles of R&D in like Every day. a day, a week, a month. So what, if I'm there for three months, I can see a hundred experiments that either work or don't work, multiple iterations of them. That's the formal reason I give people. But the real reason is it's much more fun than spending three years of my life or four years of my life, or as it turned out, more like six or seven years of my life in a, a wafer fab or like a car company. It's just, it's just people that are more interesting, right? food, restaurant, and, and how did they respond? Like you knock on the door and say, can I follow you for three months, but I, I, I'm not good at washing dishes or cutting anything. Um, like were they interested in that, in, in learning from that as well? Like how they did it, maybe not knowing actually um, that there were a lot of similarities to other industries or to other innovation places. Like how, how did they respond? I mean, you got in, so they, they said yes. Yeah. But... So I, I think that the important thing to realize is I got in more than a decade ago when this was not really like innovation in food, people cared about it, but there was not like an obsession with it yet. Or it was beginning, but I, I got in a little bit, fortunately, before it became a real obsession. So at first people were very confused that anyone wanted to do what I was doing, right? Like I'm an ethnographer, I stand around in a kitchen for a long time, I get in the way, I ask stupid questions. And so they were like, why would you want to do this? Uh, but I was very lucky. Uh, there is a chef called Jose Andres who runs uh, the Think Food Group, and he also does World Central Kitchen, which does disaster relief uh, food provision. And there's a, there's a good story there, actually, if we want to talk about it. But he was the first. Of course, person we want to talk about it. What kind of, you cannot give me that, know. and then oh, we can, but, but we don't have to talk about it right now. Um, so he. I will get he back was, to it. He was the first person who gave me the in right. So I, I met him randomly. And I told him about this idea that I had, which was that you could understand how people organize for innovation by looking at how anyone organizes well for innovation. And he happened to have a dedicated R&D team for his group of restaurants. And the reason why his group of restaurants tends to have, uh, it tends to be very successful, decent margins for a fairly high-end restaurant, very- uh, Which is not so normal. It's not so we, normal. We learned, yeah. Yeah, it's because he's got an R&D team that not only does innovation at the level of individual dishes, they also do a lot of process innovation. They work in the background, grinding out waste. They reduce the time spent to produce a particular kind of food or prep for food. And they also reduce the amount of person time that is spent to do this. So they're optimizing in the background in a way that if I was a process engineer, I would think, oh, this is actually quite cool. So he was the first one who let me in. And then once one chef lets you into the restaurant, it becomes very clear that you're not going to like really fuck things up. And then it became easier to like get in to other places. Uh, but yes, they were very confused at first by why I wanted to be there. And what I ended up doing for all of them is at the end of my time there, I would read back what I saw. Because the interesting thing about being an outsider looking in at something is you always see things which insiders do not see. And so I, I don't know whether it was very helpful for them. Like some of the chefs 
that I work with, um, I'm still pretty close to, and they were like, you have a very weird way of looking at things, but I guess it kind of makes sense. So, so it's, it was good, I think, in the end. Good, good. And then the step from kitchen to farm or to, from kitchen to soil, how, how did that happen? Yeah, so it, it actually was kind of a two-step thing. When I was way back when I was still in school, uh, I, I was a sociologist by training, uh, which means I was working in the social sciences very broadly. But one year I was also helping to teach a course on agriculture, economics, and the idea of what it means to be natural. Uh, in the biology department at, at Harvard. And that was a really formative class for me because the next year we built the class about uh, agriculture and how we think about the economics of agriculture and what it means to be natural, right? So the first class was about biodiversity. I helped to teach that one. I took it first. And then after that, we were like, this is very interesting because so much of our effect on the biodiversity and the natural habitats of the world is conditioned by and done in the context of farming because this is how we eat. And so years ago, I already had this idea, uh, thanks to the guy who originally started this uh, set of classes, that there is something interesting to think about when you think about farming. And it's not just about food, but it's about thinking about the relationship between food, the, the natural world and the environment that we live in, the economics of that relationship, and also what we think of as natural, right? Um, and when I was at these restaurants studying how they came up with new ideas, the thing which I mentioned already was I noticed that the products were highly variable. They were very different from industrial supermarket products. And as a result, they were also very different. So you could have a sequence of strawberries over the course of two months that were different old varieties that you know, would fruit at different times. They would be planted in different places by this one um, Danish farmer, for example. And it was something that I guess I had realized in the past, but it was a real revelation to have it very concretely illustrated that how you grow actually has a real effect on what you eat. And then over time, as I got interested in uh, wine, as I started obviously looking at the restaurant industry a lot more, uh, I also started to think about the effect of what I was studying, uncertainty, and how we respond to it uh, on farms. Because I also care a lot about climate change. And obviously, agriculture is one of the places where climate change causes uncertainty in the production of food. And thinking about how farmers and the businesses that fund them and the businesses that run farming operations have to deal with uncertainty became something that became very obviously an important thing to think about. Uh, which is how I got into the wheat part. But that one, I think we should definitely talk about afterwards. Absolutely. Yeah, no. So what would be the main, I'm not saying message even, but yeah, no, actually, yes. The From from the studies you've done, the work you've done on the uncertainty piece, what, what is the main, like apply to, let's say, specifically agriculture and food? Mm -hmm. um, how do we, I wouldn't say, how do we get more comfortable with it? Because that's not, but how do we, because we are living in a very uncertain world yeah. um, and it seems to be getting only more uncertain. How do we deal with that? Yeah. Um, okay. So if the question is what, what is the main sort of like takeaway idea? Uh, I think the first one is we need to really understand that there is a difference between a risky situation and a not risky situation where we don't know what is going on. And the reason for that is uh, when you are in a truly risky situation, you don't know exactly what's going to happen, right? You don't know how it's going to happen. You don't know exactly what's going to happen, but you know all the possibilities for the things that could happen and you know all the things that you could do. And also very importantly, you know exactly the probability that any action that you take results in any particular outcome. And what this allows you to do, this very artificial situation of knowing almost everything about what you don't know, what that allows you to do is it allows you to believe that you have more control over a situation of not knowing than you actually do. It allows you to believe that you have the ability to do a cost-benefit analysis that's precise enough to tell you how to act. It allows you to, to do an expected value analysis that allows you to say, if I do this, it will maximize my expected value in the future, so I will do that. Now, if you are in a situation where you don't know all the possible outcomes, you don't know all the possible actions you can take, and you don't know the probabilities that any given action results in any given outcome, those methods for thinking about how you decide what action to take, they make no sense. 
right? The math just doesn't make sense. But even if you don't talk about the math, just conceptually, it doesn't make sense to say, I'm going to take this single big action because the expected outcome is the best when you don't know all the possible actions, all the possible outcomes, and all their specific and exact probabilities. It just makes no sense to think about it that way. So I think the biggest takeaway is let's first be very clear about when we are facing truly risky situations in real life. Almost never. The only truly risky situation is flipping a fair coin, tossing a fair dice, right? Most of what we face and certainly almost everything that almost all of the major problems that farmers now face, like the problems of highly unpredictable weather, the problems of unpredictable soil quality changes as a result of unpredictable weather, the result of anthropogenic changes in pest and also disease pressure on crops, all of those things, we know sort of where things are going, but we definitely don't know them enough with enough exactitude to be able to use a risk mindset. We need to think differently. So the biggest takeaway is, let's be very clear, most of the big problems that we face as society, and certainly in agriculture, they are not risk problems of not knowing. They are non-risk, they're harder problems of not knowing. After that, we can talk about how we deal with that, because I think that's yeah, where you want to Yeah, because the risk go. is we sort of get paralyzed. We say, okay, we don't know. We don't call it risks because they are not, but as they are even harder problems, yeah. I'm just not going to plant or like, Correct. who yeah. cares about agroforestry because yes. chances are we, we, we don't have enough water in five, 10 years when the trees yeah. mature. Like it, it, it can be a paralyzing exactly. um, thought. Yeah. So, so I think the, the biggest thing is, I think that there are ways to think about a situation of non-risk not knowing. I mean, these words are very clunky. I, I just want to not use the word risk when I don't mean it. I don't want to use the word uncertainty when it means lots of different things, right? That's why I'm using things like non-risk not knowing. If we're in a situation of non-risk not knowing, one of the big dangers, not risks, the big dangers is we simply don't act because we're paralyzed. We see this with climate change right now, right? Like inaction is the biggest problem. Another danger is that we take actions that are too big to be appropriate for our level of knowledge about what the situation is. A third danger, not risk, is that we don't understand enough how much we actually value the outcomes that may result. This is something which is a really big thing, especially in farming, right? Because for instance, one of the things that we, not all of us, but one of the things that traditionally agriculture is measured by is uh, traditional productivity, the amount of a crop that can be grown on a particular piece of land given particular inputs. Uh, is that the correct way to value how agriculture works? Maybe we should be thinking more long-term in terms of uh, net organic matter reduction in soil, whether that's zero positive or negative, whether there is something about the quality of the food that's grown on it, whether there is a ratio between the inputs into the land or the system and the outputs that come out of it over time. All of these are different ways of thinking about the value of agriculture that right now I think are very much in flux. We, we literally don't know what the correct thing is. So to say that one particular measure is correct and we should optimize around that measure, that to me is the wrong way to think about it. And that comes out of a mindset of risk that inappropriately sort of interprets a, a non-risk situation of not knowing as being- Yeah, because we, we come out of a world or a situation back in the day where, where famine, especially after the second world war was the big risk and we've seen it and that we should never have that happen again and somehow we slipped into this world of okay the only thing that matters whatever the cost whatever the input whatever the ratio mm -hmm. which is often very bad mm -hmm. like the amount of calories it takes to to grow our calories is is staggering mm -hmm. um, but as long as the yields are high enough we're we're mm -hmm. fine yeah. and and yeah that mindset or that has gotten got us into I mean, of course it saved many places from famine we can talk about malnutrition and, and yeah. not being nourished. That's a different uh, uh, place, but we did grow a lot of calories, at least. That's the, the underlying, with all the Absolutely. costs involved in that. And now the question is that yeah. system seems to be shifting and, and the question is, okay, what are we going to optimize for? What What is our, 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 our gold star or our focus point? Definitely mm -hmm. not yield only. Yeah, um, I, I think one of the things that is very interesting about this podcast is this very clear focus on um, the ways in which agriculture becomes economically viable, right? So I, I think it's also really important to point out that, you know, from a humanitarian perspective, obviously, I'm not, I'm never gonna use the word risk unless I actually mean a situation where we know all the outcomes, all the actions and all the probabilities, I just won't. 
I'll say that one of the big dangers that the Green Revolution may have appeared to save us from is this idea that we can have systemic famine across Europe and the world the way we used to, right? And the idea that you can artificially boost the productivity of particular systems of agriculture or pieces of land so that you never have a deficit of calories being grown. Um, that's definitely true. And I think the question that you're posing is, if we wanted to make an economically viable system where we have a different way of valuing the work of agriculture, not just how many calories are grown, but also how long can we grow the same number of calories and can we grow higher quality calories and how do we define quality for those calories in a sustainable way over time? Sustainable meaning we can grow in this way indefinitely into the future. Uh, if we frame the work of agriculture as that, current agriculture for the most part, certainly current monocrop industrial agriculture, that does not really seem to do it, right? No, not, not at all. Plus all the externalities or whatever word we want to use. Mm -hmm. So the question is, yeah, what we try to, um, to explore in this podcast, what's the tool of money and the tool of finance? Yeah. Um, what's the role? And, and I think after 230 episodes, we can say there is a role. We still don't really know what the role is, yeah. but I think for investors, people that are either putting their own money or, or other people's money to, to work. And, and it could be our pension funds and, and others. I think it would be really good to understand what um, mindset is needed to put money to work in a way that makes sense long term, because yes. that would be nice for a pension fund, for yeah. instance. Yeah, yeah. And most of the time we sort of default, we meaning the, the, the more general we in, in the big institutions to the things we already know, um, and with quite disastrous outcomes at the moment, like you just keep putting money into and um, nicely presented PowerPoints of monoculture funds that maybe put a few mm -hmm. SDG uh, um, logos on that and they also save a bit of water, but we all know that's not going to be enough. Like yeah. that's not going to, that's not going to generate, regenerate. So everybody's using regeneration uh, now, uh, of course, as a exactly. term. I even saw the glyphosate renewal group in Europe using uh, regenerative agriculture as a term they liked. Um, so we also have to be cautious there. So the question is, yeah, how in this, all this plethora of options and, and scenarios and uncertainty that's definitely increasing. We just have to look outside. Current uh, um, spring is disastrous in many places in Europe and other places. What do you do? Yeah, what do you, how do you get not paralyzed? As a farmer, I, I, you, you have to mm -hmm. keep going, but also as an investor, you cannot sit on your money. You have to, it yes. has to get out of the I door mean, at some you, point. You have to deploy it, right? Because you've got a, a yeah. deployment mandate. Absolutely. Okay, so um, weirdly in another current life, I, I build investable assets for special situations funds, right? So it's very different from agriculture. But one of the things that I've found from talking to people who are supposed to be investing for alpha, you know, these are hedge funds and special sits. Uh, we know that they need to deploy for sure, because there is pressure. By the time you get to the financial, the year end, people want to close deals, right? They want to deploy and close the deal. So that is understandable. Now, what's really interesting is even for people who are trying to, you know, their only criterion for whether or not they're successful seems to be what is the return adjusted for a very specific, both both precise a precise number for the estimated risk of an investment. They're trying to maximize the risk adjusted return, right? Uh, I think that, Okay, so so let, let's let's drill down on your question. Like, if you're an investor, what can you do? I think you need to specify two things. The first one is you have to be a long-term investor because agriculture and the problems that you're talking about, to me, these are not short-term things. They can they simply cannot be there by definition. I think the second one is. What do you mean by long term? Like how long? Is by, that? by long term, I'm talking. We're not talking five, ten, fifteen years. Like you have to be investing at the generational scale, right? Like okay, yeah, twenty so year plus, twenty year plus, Minimum. at least, yeah. and even twenty year plus. Like if we're very honest, like if you're only investing twenty year plus, that's still not long enough. But even now, twenty year plus seems impossible, right? <laughs> well, not impossible. It just seems very hard. Very few people are doing From, twenty year plus investments yeah. at the moment. Um, so first of all, it has to be long term. And the second is, I think maybe as an investor, especially one that is interested in and genuinely concerned about the impact of investment on the world that we live in and whether or not it will continue to exist in a habitable form, the idea that you need to always pursue maximizing financial returns. Like, so this comes back to this question of value again. 
I wonder whether it is possible to have a system that is both good for sustainable long-term agriculture and one that only insists on maximizing single variable financial returns. I don't think it's possible actually. So conditioned on this idea that it's a long-term investor and also that it may be an investor that has multiple ideas of what a successful outcome is in investment. Multiple, I think there's a, non, not only financial return. Not only financial, CK. yes. Yeah. It, it might be some other stuff. We don't know what they are yet, but they have to be at least willing to say it's not just financial. We're willing to trade off some financial for something else. We don't know what that is, but they must be willing to do some of that trade off. Then I think that there are some things we can say about what you can do to not be paralyzed. I think the first thing is if you are a, if you are an investor you already think about the idea of portfolios right you don't invest in just one kind of thing you invest in a range of kinds of things and you try and diversify i thought that if you just all invest in biochar then we change the world no there's no there's no goal single well, single solution no, to no, all for, of this for, for sure for sure. Uh, I, I think Sorry, I making think fun of the biochar also, people. That, I don't mean that, uh, biochar people. Don't start emailing. Yeah. I mean, well, biochar is very important, but it's a portfolio <laughs> approach. Yeah. Yes, it's a portfolio approach. But um, and, and we should also talk about sort of like, um, like me too and follower dynamics in anything, including investment, which is why things like crypto have this big and then it goes away. And then now it's AI and it goes away or it's biochar and it goes away, maybe or regenerative agriculture and it goes away, right? Um, so there, there are those dynamics. But if you are a long-term investor that is willing to have multiple criteria of success that are trade, traded off between each other, the things that you can do to avoid being paralyzed are, one, really think about what it means to diversify a portfolio. What it means to diversify a portfolio is you have lots of different things that might succeed or fail in different ways under different conditions. So the idea that you should have multiple different approaches to farming becomes something which is truly beneficial from a portfolio approach, not just something that you talk about and then you only invest in monocrop agriculture in multiple countries, for instance, or monocrops across multiple different kinds of crops. Maybe a different way to think about it is investing in multiple ways of farming, some of which are industrial monocrop large, and some others we don't even know yet, but they, but they will have to not be industrial or not large or not monocrop or not large industrial monocrop. You know, you can like break it up in all sorts of different ways. So that's one thing. Um, and the benefit of thinking about a true portfolio approach in that way is it naturally leads you to take small experiments uh, in the sense that when you experiment with a small investment, you have basically done a small scale trial of something that could work or might fail, but you've not invested your whole fund behind it. You have literally done something which diversifies your portfolio. I, a lot of investment managers will not like this because the management overhead of an investment strategy that has lots of very small investments is high, right? But maybe this is a trade-off that needs to be made in terms of how you measure the success of your fund. Uh, that if you really want to do something very good, and you don't know how to do it yet, which is definition, definitionally true, uh, you can't expect to run your fund the way a fund would run if the fund knew exactly how it should be run, right? That kind of optimization and efficiency only happens when you really know what's going on. And right now, frankly, do we know what's going on with farming in a sustainable way for a planet where the population is growing like ours is? No, we absolutely don't. That, that is simply not, that's simply not the case. No, nobody would say that they do know this. Right. So maybe one of the things that needs to be traded off is this idea that uh, investments are very big and chunky, that returns are only financial and need to be maximized, and that returns need to be short term on the order of a fund return schedule, right? Like maybe a 10 year fund return or something like that. So if we get rid of those three things, suddenly a lot of things I think become possible. You may not like to hear it, but I think a lot of things become possible. Yeah, and it also, like the, the time piece you mentioned, like when we think 20 plus years, yeah. who knows how we're going to calculate financial returns? Like who knows how the big, like the, the subsidy schemes have changed. Who yes. knows what we're paying for ecosystem services? Nobody knows, but we're yeah. pretty sure that some of the big, the, the things that seem normal now will have shifted. Like, Absolutely. will we continue to pay billions and billions of dollars in Europe basically for plowing? <laughs> Probably not. Is it yes. going to happen in five years? We don't know. It's going to happen in 10 right. years. Who knows? But yeah. it's going to happen in 30 years. 
probably were going to run, yes. out, run out of money before that. The same with very large subsidy schemes for for chemical inputs yes. and insurance policies in in the US. Like at some point, that might change how and exactly what, etc. But will it stay exactly the same as it, it's now? Probably not. It could get worse as well, of course, if lobbying yeah. is very strong. Um, but but the goalposts will have changed as well. The field would have changed in shape and form and and uh, probably yeah. grass type. Um, <laughs> and so basically, <laughs> you're you're saying like small. A lot of small bats or a lot a number of small bats yeah. and see what sticks because we don't know yeah um, which sounds like good investing in general but that's yeah what, maybe. well, well the, i think the interesting thing is if you think about investment like so capital management right is sort of the industry that we're talking about and the nice thing about it is that there are lots and lots and lots of different sources of capital lots of lots of institutions that are deploying it at different sizes and and this goes actually to your point about you know people who are all into biochar, all into regen, all into crypto, or whatever it is that they're all into. Like, as an industry for capital deployment, people should be doing as much of their own thing as they can, so that across the industry, money is going to all sorts of different things, right? Because that seems to be the way that uh, when it becomes clear that one of the things is generally better than another you've actually done a broad search. Like if you think about the terrain of how we do farming better and invest in farming better, it's very rugged, as they say, you know, like the terrain that we are exploring is very rugged. It's very unknown and searching it is expensive. So instead of focusing on just one area like biochar, like there should be a lots and lots of flowers are blooming everywhere. Lots of people trying things out at first. And when things begin to seem as though they work, that's when they should attract a bit more investment. And then when those things take off a little bit more, they attract even more investment. So broadly speaking, and I know this will be impossible also, like investment managers and people seeking out opportunities should try very hard to think on their own as well, right? Because the reason why you get people glomming on is, uh, unfortunately, lacking of imagination. Like if you lack imagination, you look at other people to tell you where to go. If you genuinely have your own imagination, then you look for your own thing. And historically, this is what the most successful fund managers have done. They've found a way to make money that has not been outcompeted by other people who are already doing it. And it's the followers that don't do as well, right? Um, so one, one thing which I also wanted to say, which I, you probably have a view on, is I think in terms of returns, capital sources also have different priorities. And if you are an investor investing on behalf of your, you know, of your capital sources, uh, it may be interesting to try and understand what trade-offs your different sources of capital may have and what trade-offs that they are willing and not willing to make, right? So I know, for instance, that there are some family offices which represent in, in some cases quite a lot of money, which are willing to sacrifice financial return if they believe that there are long-term pro-social or environmental benefits to their investments. Uh, I'm sure a lot of the Regen Ag, Sustainable Ag uh, funds are actually already sourcing capital from these people. But I think it may be, it may be sensible in reducing paralysis to really understand what your capital sources are willing to give up to get what they really, really want, right? So we always talk about goals. What are our goals in investment? And we very rarely talk about what we are and are not willing to trade off or give up in order to get there. And I think this is absolutely one of the most important things for anyone to do. And if we're talking about investment and investment management, then it's really important to understand as someone who is investing somebody else's money, what the money cares about and what it doesn't care about and is willing to give up. And that can also- it might be, yeah, it might be not just a single, like a single return. Like it's not only mm -hmm. like money has um, different, different goals as well. It's not just optimizing only and only for X, Y, Z. Um, and you see that with a lot of foundations and others, like they're looking for good stories as well, because they have a magazine to bring out. Yes, they're looking for, for sure. the, the right pictures and, and which sometimes is, is, is good and sometimes is bad, but at least it's good to understand and, or they need to get money out of the door because it's the end of the year or they, there's so many different ways to look at it, but you have to be uh, conscious of that. I wanted to double click on one thing before you said, because that's the reason I reached out, um, of course, reading your newsletter. But uh, when you were talking about population weed, how do we, what can we learn from that looking at a portfolio? Because it sounds very similar. Oh my gosh, yes. And, 
<laughs> because that's when I clicked and I was like, yeah. oh, that's so fascinating. But cool. I think I don't know how many people um, know about that in, unless you're a wheat farmer and um, how many people may, make or made that connection. Sure. Um, okay. I, I love that you're asking about this because it gets really nerdy as you say. Uh, okay. So let's just start by saying like, what is a population wheat, right? So a lot of the wheat, I, I would say the vast, vast majority of the wheat that we grow, wheat, wheat is a massive uh, commodity crop. It's one of the, I think it's one of the three or four or five largest in the world or something, right? By, by volume. So the vast majority of that is grown as monocrops, like a single, a single variety of wheat is grown in I don't know, hundreds of hectares of, maybe even, are, are they even thousand hectare farms? Maybe they are in Canada somewhere. There are so, hundreds of thousand hectare farms. Okay. Even, yeah. So in, in the so Midwest, like, Australia has a huge expanses of basically genetically identical wheat that are grown. Um, that's the analog to that is imagining a city where every single person is a clone of every single other person, right? Now, a population wheat in contrast, is a field of wheat where there are potentially multiple varieties of wheat growing, sometimes 10, sometimes hundreds of different varieties of wheat. And they're all growing together. And then they also usually, I mean, they must get harvested together, right? Because they're plant, they're interplanted. They're not planted in rows separated by variety. They're generally planted together. And the, the analog to that in the city is a city where there's people who are of lots of different ethnic backgrounds, who do lots of different things. They're genetically different. And I think the main difference between a way of thinking about growing wheat that is monocultural versus one that is populational, if you will, is that a monocultural wheat, uh, if you find a disease, for instance, that attacks that particular monocrop, uh, you might be in a situation where maybe hundreds of thousands of hectares of wheat are fucked all at once. But if you were in a population wheat context, you might find that, okay, that one year, that one variety that is susceptible to this fungus or that insect, uh, that particular one doesn't do very well, but the rest of the field is okay. So there is a kind of a resistance to unexpected pressure on the population, the more diverse the population is, right? So imagine if you've got a population of 200 wheats and one year you have a really low rainfall year and you happen to have some wheat in that population that really need a lot of water. Those wheats don't do well, but the wheats that are fairly drought tolerant, they do well. So your overall yield in the population context is not so low. It's, it's gone down a bit, but it's buffered by the fact that there are varieties in the population that are just not as susceptible to that particular disruption that happened. Now, imagine you've got a year when you've got multiple disruptions. What this means is those multiple disruptions will affect different parts of the population more or less, but the more diverse your population is, the more likely it is that there, the population's diversity itself will buffer the impact of these disruptions on your yield. So I think that, that's the first thing, that diversity itself is a buffer against um, like perturbation or disturbance from unexpected sources on the way it grows and how much you get out of it. But then, of course, as you know, with population wheats, you can also think, what are the kinds of wheats in the population? Are they modern varieties that are highly bred for particular reasons? Or are they heritage varieties from previously, right? Land races that have been saved and put together again, because there are all sorts of other interesting things about the difference between old wheats and new wheats, about how tall they grow, how deep their root systems are, their relative contribution to a low input farming system for wheat that has high rotation, and also that actually returns soil organic matter to the soil rather than taking it away. So we can talk about all that, but I don't know, do we want to? And then, no, and then my, I, to, a lot of questions, but two yeah. main ones. What happens when you harvest? Yes. Because that's gonna be messy. And then what do you, and what do, you do with that? Or does that get into it? I'm just assuming you got into the population wheat through chefs that, that might be like, it's not going to get your standard loaf of bread, I'm imagining. Correct. Like what happens when you harvest and yeah. how do you, you have to separate all of it or how do you process no. it or bake it? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. So um, I actually, this made sense to me from thinking about a way of 
uh, making wine called a field blend, but we, we don't have to talk about it because it, it's not actually relevant. Um, so how you harvest a population wheat is you've got maybe hundred, let's say you've got a hundred varieties all growing in the field at the same time. The idea is you harvest them all together, but you combine over the top and then you mill, right? The resulting grain. Now, the reason why this is kind of a fundamental mindset shift is because if you are growing a monoculture wheat and you want flour that has particular characteristics like this amount of protein, this type of gluten um, ratio, you need to grow a wheat that has been bred for that specific thing. So every single grain of wheat that you harvest, when you mill it, will have the final physical chemical properties that you want in the flour that you mill from it. Now, if you're growing a population wheat, what you're really looking for is when you mill the population, the population gives you the properties that you want. So you need to find a mix of different kinds of wheats that will give you the protein level, the, the final char level, I mean, depends on what country you're in, how they measure stuff, or the ratio of glutens that you, that you need. And so what you're really saying is, instead of saying that we are going to breed or find individual wheats that have this particular characteristic. It's a portfolio of wheat. It's a portfolio of wheat, exactly. It's a portfolio that is diverse because it is inherently diverse genetically, but it's also diverse in terms of the properties that it has. And if you recall our previous conversation about the robustness of a portfolio approach in investment, this is a portfolio approach to growing wheat, right? Like if you grow a portfolio of wheat, you can be slightly more assured that if the climate changes in some quite unexpected way, you are not necessarily guaranteed to not have a crop failure, but you are much more likely to have a badly performing but still okay year, I think, than if you're growing a monocrop that just needs a lot of water, for instance, and you suddenly go into a drought year. Um, so, so to answer your first question, like if you, what happens when you harvest? You harvest the whole thing and you process the whole thing, right? So it requires changing the way a miller thinks about how they produce flour because it used to be that the miller would just roll and mill something and they would separate all the streams and recombine it to get the flour that they want. Now what you're doing is you're saying, we're going to take what the farmer gives us and we're going to mill it into a wheat that has these properties. And if the farmer did his or her job correctly, we'll have wheat that is in the range of what we need, right? So the whole chain from farmer, in fact, from wheat breeder to farmer, to miller, to user of the wheat, they need to be reacting to the situation differently. They need to be sort of responding to what is happening and adjusting rather than expecting something to happen and then being surprised when it doesn't happen. And your second question, like, how do you bake with this stuff, right? Like, if it's not standard wheat. How does it produce, taste? How does it taste? I mean, it's amazing. Uh, so the, the actual person, I, I'm, I'm basically reporting a lot of synthesized information that I got from a group of people that I periodically sort of hang out with online and in person that work on baking with basically more sustainably grown wheats, many of which are heritage wheats that are also grown in populations. Um, one guy that I especially want to call out is this guy, John Letts, who has been breeding populations of wheats for functional reasons uh, for a while. He's based in the UK, uh, worth looking at what he's doing. One of the things that he realized early on, and also a lot of the bakers have realized from working with this, I mean, population wheats exist all over the place, right? The, the ones that I know are the ones in English speaking countries. So I don't want to elide or conceal the fact that this is happening everywhere. Uh, although the ones I know about tend to be in English speaking countries, the bakers who work with this kind of wheat, they need to change the way they work, right? You cannot dial in a recipe with a blend the flour that comes from a miller and expect it to work exactly the same way all the time, which is what a traditional industrial bakery would do. They would specify a flour from a miller. The, if they were big enough, the miller would like blend the flour to their specifications. They would develop a recipe and a process for baking the bread, and then they would just churn it up. If you are a baker working with a population wheat that's milled, especially if it's a stone milled wheat, where you know the stone milling means that the entirety of the wheat is in the flour, only the big, it's sorted by size of grain uh, particle rather than by part of the, of the grain. You really need to be reacting to the dough that you're mixing on the day itself. And I'm not a baker, but I've got good friends who are, 
And w- one of them, actually, they're really good friends. They run a bakery that specializes in using population wheats and heritage wheats. And the baker, Kate, uh, she it, it sometimes is frustrating when you get a new batch of wheat and you realize it works quite differently from how it used to work. But over one or two bakes, you learn how to figure it out. And the thing I've noticed about Kate and other bakers who work with population wheats and weird wheats like these that are highly variable, which is very similar to chefs working with ingredients that change over time, is over time you become better at dealing with stuff you don't know, right? You become, you, you no longer need your products and your ingredients to always be exactly the same for you to not feel like, oh shit, what's going on? Now you can say, oh, you know, I'm just going to have to deal with it. And that kind of resilience and robustness. Yeah, you almost know like which two bakes you need to do to understand. Like, okay, I make a focaccia first, and I make a bread second, Absolutely. and then I usually have figured it out. Yeah, that's uh, well, how to adjust water levels, how to adjust yeah. fermentation time, rising, mm-hmm. and and they, you get so good that you you can just absorb the variety. Uh, literally, I, I mean, in management speak, they would call it absorptive capacity for uncertainty, right? I mean, they would call it absorptive capacity for knowledge. For me, I, I think of absorptive capacity as like more generally, can you take what the environment throws at you and deal with it? Or do you just like get paralyzed? Um, let's abstract away from what you said, right? It's not just in the baking context, I know what to bakes I need to do and how to learn. More generally, if you as a decision maker are put into a situation where things are not as you expect, do you get paralyzed and not know what to do? Or do you know how to figure things out? And are you comfortable? Are you not panicking? Are you taking reasonable, sensible actions to figure out the environment. I think that capacity is really important. And it's what working with a population wheat does. And it's what taking a real sort of portfolio approach to the actions that you take could do. And I think it abstracts beyond wheat and beyond baking. It's a metaphor, if you will, for a different way of dealing with a world that is much more uncertain, not risky. It's filled with not risk forms of not knowing. And to stay in a metaphor, what hap- the, the second question, one question was how do you harvest and eat it? But secondly, um, what happens over time? Like how do you, in population wheat, make sure, and in your portfolio, but let's say population wheat, what can we learn from population wheat? Make sure it keeps, um, I mean, you called it maintenance by design and, and sort of adaptivity over time, because you don't want to use the same population wheat every time, because that's sort of counterintuitive. Yeah, no, I um, thank you for reading that particular article about maintenance. Um, Yes, I I think also the difference between how you think about the ongoing maintenance of a particular population of wheat in a particular place is an interesting one, right? Because generally what we're seeing is agriculture is usually done in one place, more or less continually. Every year you grow not exactly the same thing, but you grow more or less the same thing. So over time, the system learns, right? You learn this crop grows well here, it doesn't grow well there. This crop grows well here, but you need to manage it in this way. So with a population, I think there's a different kind of learning in addition. With a population of wheat, every year as you're growing it, you go through the field as it's growing and you see what's working well and what's not working well. Um, You also have the input from last year when you mill the wheat, uh, your bakers who use the wheat tell you, you know, it feels a bit weak. I cannot make a loaf out of it. It's a biscuit flour, as they say. I can only use it for something that doesn't require gluten crumb structure on the inside. And I want something that gives me a crumb structure. So what you can do is you can begin to adjust by selecting in the population. So if you're walking in the wheat, uh, you can be picking out particular kinds of varieties that you see because they, they actually look different that are not performing so well, right? So let's say you're walking through the wheat midway through the season and there are some varieties that are clearly very successful. They're very vigorous, they're growing very well. And then there's some that look kind of meh. Now, if you want to promote the successful ones, which are adapting to the environment, right? Those varieties do well in this environment. What you do is you pick out the ones that don't work so well. And the next year, when you take some of the seed that you harvested, when you harvested the entire field and you plant them, what you've got is you've got a blend of wheats that is related to the previous year's population, but is enriched in the in the varieties that worked well in that field because you took away the ones that weren't working so well in the field right so how do which you maintain is a fundamental problem? piece like exactly. you save your own seeds yes. which means you're not using hybrids or and and you the population wheat learns over time yes. or adapts over time correct of course with climate but also adapts over time what does well here yes and and that's a function of both climate 
what you need the wheat to do functionally, and also the physiography of the place, right? The aspect, the soil, the access to water, the temperature, the daylight, everything, it eventually shows up in something which you can see. It's like a wheat, is it growing fast? Is it not growing fast? Is it attacked by fungus? Is it not attacked by fungus? And if it isn't doing well there, fine, you take out some of it. If it keeps not doing well there, you take out more of it. And then the next year, the population. So it's not that the wheats are evolving. Uh, the wheats may be evolving. It's the population and its composition that's evolving over time. Um, and I think there's something relevant here to say about this idea of a portfolio of initially small experiments, because this is what, as you said before, a population field is, right? It's a field where every single variety of wheat that you plant is an experiment to see whether or not it works well in this place. Like any investment in a particular kind of farming company or farming business model is maybe a small or a big experiment in whether or not that will work. If it looks like it's working well, if the wheat is growing fast, if it's not attacked by pests or fungus or disease, you keep it. If it isn't doing well, you take it out. Again, if your small business investment, if your small portfolio investment looks like it's doing well and you have to have different ideas of what it means to be doing well, you maybe put some more money in it. Maybe you find a co-investor to go in in the next round. If it isn't doing well, maybe you don't do that. And over time, the portfolio evolves as a portfolio in the same way that the field of wheat and the population of wheat that, grow, that grows on it every year evolves as a population. Yeah, no, it's fascinating, the, the similarities of what we can learn there, uh, which makes it, I mean, that's, that's why I reached out. Um, and so it's sort of a natural bridge actually to a question I, I always like to ask is what would you do if you were be an investor and, and not just with a small portfolio, but actually we're, we're um, burdening you with, with quite a large one, let's say a billion euros, um, or dollars, let, it doesn't really matter or, or whatever currency, but a lot of money, let's say the, the, the amount is not the issue. Of course, I'm not interested in exact dollar amounts or euros amounts, but I'm interested in how you would approach it and what would you prioritize? Uh, okay, great question. Um, one which I haven't thought about because nobody's offered me a billion euros to deploy. Although I would love it if someone did offer me a billion euros to deploy. Okay, so off the top of my head, what I would probably do is I would say, let's take a, a chunk of it, right? And let's deploy it in a way that right now seems to make sense. And a chunk of it, not meaning 50%, I, I would say like something, a big piece that is not majority. Let's say like put 25% into approaches that currently seem to make sense. And then for all of those investments, give them, I don't know, a determinate horizon before you don't default invest more, but you evaluate to see whether or not they're still working. Now for the remaining majority of the funds, I think one of the things I would do, and this is inspired a bit by some um, recent grant programs that are coming out of the US primarily, is I would try and find a lot of people with very different opinions from me who have articulated different ideas on what it means to be successful in, in this case, I guess, sustainable agriculture. And when I say sustainable, I mean not the sort of greenwashing idea. It means we can continue to grow in this way in perpetuity, right? Like net organic matter reduction positive. in the soil. Yeah. It's like either net zero, zero change or positive. And a lot of, there's a bunch of other things that mean sustainable. Uh, I want people with very different opinions from me about how to do it and what it means to be successful. And I would give them some money each and tell them to go invest, right? Because what I'm really trying to do and what I've been advocating for is to have lots and lots and lots, as many as we can, investment theses that are operationalized as multiple small investments at first that have a relatively short time frame initially to an initial assessment of whether or not you should re-up. Because you would keep in touch with them in a sense, like you would, you want to get signals back, like, is yeah. it working or not yes. to be potentially doubling down? Yes, absolutely. And I think one of the things I would also do is I'm, I think this is maybe less of a problem in agriculture and more of a problem in food technology, but there, there does seem to be this idea from that comes primarily out of the venture capital world that your portfolio, uh, you'll have one or two companies that return the whole fund and then fund. the rest yeah. don't, right? And so There's this no leads, reason who cares, yeah. Th this leads you to the need for unicorns and all this other stuff. 
I think I would also try and find a majority of these like people with very different ideas from me, but they must share one belief, which is that every kind of business should initially be aimed at being something which is robust enough to make enough money to pay for itself even before it reaches supposedly operational scale, right? So instead of having a minimum efficient size that is very high, which is the implicit idea behind this like one investment returns the fund model, I would try and find agriculture that generally, because this is the history of agriculture up until now for the entire world, really, agriculture has almost always begun as something which always made it work from the beginning at a small scale, right? So there's no real sense now, I think, in trying to only find agriculture that only works when you reach massive scale. It just makes no sense. So that's probably, so the three things I would do, 25% of it or some you know big amount that's not the majority to things that we currently believe maybe make sense. So things like biochar, like mycorrhizal inoculation, like specific forms of regenerative farming, which include things like population heritage weeds that have very deep root systems, things like that, because we can, we already have some idea that maybe they work. We can see whether they work fairly fast within like a determinate horizon and then split the rest among a lot of people with different ideas, especially from the person who's running the fund, very different ideas about how to get to success and what success means uh, for deployment restricted mostly to small investments per deployer and also with the idea that the deployments are meant to not just be economically viable at scale but economically viable from the beginning they should be things that a private equity company would be willing to invest in rather than only a vc would be willing to invest in right so that's sort of where i think i would go fascinating approach and then Another question we like to ask, what it, so we take away your fund, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but we do give you a magic wand and, and the power to change one thing, which could be in food and egg or in general, uh, overnight, what would that be? Ooh, uh, that's interesting. One thing that I think would be very interesting, but of course it's impossible and everyone would hate it, is just take away every single subsidy. Just take away all the explicit subsidies. You don't have to take away the implicit subsidies on energy, which obviously feed in a lot. Just take away all the explicit, like take away the farm bill in the US, take away whatever it is that the EU's agriculture subsidies. Cop, yeah. yeah, just take that away. Just gone. What you do with the money, who knows, but get rid of it. That's it. It's not the first time somebody mentioned it. No, yeah, it's it's, uh, it would be a fascinating, no, it would be, I mean, it's not going to happen, but it, it's a, um, it would create a, not even a level playing field, but a much more relevant playing field for many to play in. And I, I mean, I opens think, up a lot. I think what it would do is it would primarily, one of the things that it would do is it would instantly make it obvious that some of the business models and systems of farming that we currently think are the default that we cannot do anything else, they're, they're not economically bad, right? So a lot of the large scale monocrop farming I don't think would be very economically viable without a lot of the price supports that we have in these major countries. And certainly without the implicit energy subsidies that we have because of you know, gas price and oil price um, caps and controls, like I think those would become very rapidly, obviously not even economically sustainable, let alone more broadly sustainable, I think. And so just taking away the explicit subsidies would show us that, and then maybe change the way people think about what alternatives to invest in. Because right now the difficulty I think is all of the economically viable models that are viable because of this weird market distortion, they seem too good as an investment that it's difficult to say, let's invest in this other stuff that's like- Yeah, because untested. you have this trade-off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, and as a final one, I, I always ask a final question and then it's never the final question, but what can we learn from wine? I mean, it's, it's, we mentioned it just a bit also in the pre-conversation, you're, you're fascinated about low intervention wine. Oh yeah. Um, I'm sure there are things to learn. What would be your main, uh, what, what's your main lesson learned? You said you got interested in wine, of course, being in these kitchens yeah. and interested in food. Uh, what's your, what have you learned? I think the main thing I've learned about wine is so. I mean, lots of stuff, but I think the thing that's most relevant here and the, and the biggest thing I learned about wine is 
what we value in a thing we consume, and this is definitely as relevant to investors, to everyone else, what we value in the thing we consume, we often think we know, right? So when I first started drinking wine, I mean, I, I was like a stupid, I had no money and I was stupid, right? So I was drinking wine that was very alcoholic and had very strong flavors. And over time, the thing which I realized was, you know, in the parlance of the economists, my preferences were really changing. I was changing my mind about what things were worth drinking in wine. Uh, as I met different people and I drank different wine. And it eventually became not just what is in the bottle, but also how it is made, who is making it, the context you're drinking it in. And as the things I value in wine and the things I'm willing to give up in wine change over time, uh, I think what that does is it changes the kinds of wines I drink and how it is that I choose to drink them. So low intervention wine is one of these like, amazing venues to learn different ways of thinking about what is valuable, right? Because low intervention wine tends to be produced in a very weird way compared to industrial wine. It tends to taste very different compared to industrial wine. It is drunk in very different settings with very different people compared to industrial wine. And I think the big learning from it is when you change your mind about what you value and what you're willing to give up, suddenly it becomes obvious that there are other actions you can take that result in different outcomes. And it's kind of fun to see not only that there is the possibility to do different things, but also to have different outcomes that result from it, right? So it's literally not knowing what you care about allows you to see that you can also not know and therefore find new things you can do, new outcomes you can achieve, and new ways to value them. And I think this is super relevant to people investing in things, right? Because if you decide that the only things you can invest in, the only actions you can take are this small set of stuff, and the only outcomes you care about, like the results of agriculture, are this small set of stuff. You don't have many investment opportunities, but the moment you say, okay, maybe other things are valuable, right? Not just financial return, but other stuff, like how tasty it is, like whether it benefits people. I mean, it all sounds very like, you know, it's, it all sounds very super liberal and everything. I, I'm actually weirdly not like that, <laughs> but the more different ways you think of that are relevant of valuing something, the more opportunities you have for thinking about ways of achieving it. And I think that's relevant for investors because I am pretty sure that there will be capital sources out there that care about different ways of valuing things from how we currently do it as a mess. And the investment managers who are able to articulate the fact that they are open to different forms of value and different actions to get there, they are going to get that capital and they're going to get the management fees to deploy it. Don't you think? Absolutely. And, and as you just argued before as well, the returns are not where everybody else is. So if you keep within your very narrow, um, narrow world, it, it's gonna, it's gonna hurt if even if you only care about financial, you're the most cynical investor out there, you couldn't care less about climate, you couldn't care less about biodiversity or taste or, or nutrients or, or soil, etc. Um, it might make sense to look beyond your, your narrow scope. Um, and, and we see that we see very mm -hmm. people that have made their returns very cynically in a good, in a good pragmatic way in, in renewable energy coming into agriculture and food because they see the potential and they see things yeah. they have disrupted before and they see a big industry that needs disruption and they, they see um, ways to, to act there. So I, I want to be conscious of your time and, and wrap it up here. But thank you so much for, for coming on and share and uh, for a very, very interesting interview. So thank you so much. Uh, thanks for having me. I, I was very pleased that you reached out and um, I'm very glad that we had this conversation because it definitely went places where I wasn't expecting it to go, which is cool. <laughs> I take this as a compliment. Yeah. Fantastic. Cool. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links we discussed in this episode, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts. If you like this episode, why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps. Thanks again and see you next time.